We live in a time when the Jesuit order, that illustrious group of men who converted so many people around the world, seem to have committed apostasy. We live in a time when the government exercises more control over our ability to worship than anyone can remember in recent memory. But there was once a time when that incredible order of men did heroic and beautiful things for the faith. And believe it or not, there was a time when the government exercised even more control over the worship and the liturgy than they do now. We're going to examine the Japanese martyrs of Nagasaki and draw from it some conclusions about our own day. So let's get started. Living the Faith Podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. RestoringTheFaith.com Mike here, alone in studio once again. This is the Living the Faith show in the illustrious studio here in the heart of America. I am so glad to be talking to you today because this is a real... First of all, the Feast of the Assumption is coming up. It's the 15th of August. As I'm recording this, we're just uh, a couple weeks out from that. And it is on the Feast of the Assumption that St. Francis Xavier arrives in Japan. The year, of course, is uh, 1549. I had to look at my notes, so it's not really an of course thing. Um, St. Francis Xavier arrived in Japan, and he was the first European to get past the shores. He makes his way into the heart of the country, and he founds a mission in Nagasaki. Nagasaki would eventually become the seat of the bishop there in Japan because it became ultimately a Christian city in otherwise a pagan land. Now at this time, Japan had not been open to the world. Japan homogenized. Everybody looked the same. They behaved the same. They thought the same. They had the same creed which essentially was the Shinto creed, ancestral worship, paganism, idolatry. At the time of his arrival, St. Francis Xavier could not have known any of this, but there was an intense power struggle happening on that island nation. The emperor was living in exile. The emperor, the rightful heir to his people, was living in a gilded prison and... Uh, a group of dictators of uh, various last names um, who, who each time one would die, they would all jockey for power for the next one. They were in charge of the island nation. But St. Francis Xavier, when he arrived, he immediately started beginning preaching the gospel. He founded schools. He brought civilization Western medicine, science, surgery. Although he didn't immediately speak the language, faith is something that is contagious uh, in feeling more so than it is in thought. And he converted thousands and baptized thousands. He eventually did learn the language very well. Just a little aside, when Francis Xavier found out that the word that he was using for God that, that uh, in, in Japanese was actually a misnomer. He was using the incorrect word. He was using a word that was a reference to the Buddha. Uh, so uh, he, was, he was pretty embarrassed by that and, and changed his ways. So St. Francis Xavier is the first, he's a Jesuit, he's the first Catholic priest to make his way into the center, into, inside the country. He founds a Christian uh, civilization there. They even eventually built, I mean, there was a bishop there. There were 15 young men who were made priests, um, Japanese men, of course. Uh, they, were, they were all ruthlessly hunted down and killed later. And I'm going to give you the broad story of the Catholics in Japan. And there's a reason why I'm doing this show now. Okay, first of all, uh, many of you know that I was at one point for nearly three years stationed in Japan. So this... 
Um, this store is near and dear to my heart. I never got to see Nagasaki. I wanted to see Nagasaki. Uh, too busy with uh, wars and training and, and all those things. But I do have a deep appreciation, love, and affinity for the Japanese people. They are such an incredible people. They are well-ordered, disciplined, patient, graceful, stunningly polite, scrupulously honest. Um, they really are a remarkable people that possess a lot, a great deal of natural virtue. And so I have a, I have an affinity and an admiration for the Japanese people. And I, I hope to do this story justice. But this story is instructive because what we are living through in 2020, what we are living through today, we can look to the past for some clues about not only where things are going, but how we're going to survive it. All right, so uh, I've got three or four major stories to tell you about the history of Catholicism in Japan. The first is a story of the basically the Japanese Thomas More. You've never heard of this man's name, probably. Uh, and by the way, a great uh, source document for this, it's a book called A Song for Nagasaki. Um, so if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about the Japanese Catholics, Song for Nagasaki. Now, that book is a biopic about a specific man who survived the nuclear attack on Nagasaki. Um, his wife and, chil and child did not. He ultimately died from radiation poisoning. He was a, radi a radiological scientist, one of the very first X-ray technicians and scientists in Japan, um, and I believe that his cause is moving forward. Now, this man, this book is about uh, Togashi Nagai. Now, Togashi is a direct descendant of one of the stories that I'm going to tell you, so that's why it's so exciting. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about him. We might do another show just about him, and we could do another show just about him. There's an old black and white movie, I think, by the same title, A Song for Nagasaki, that is a biopic about him and his wife and his son. Uh, and the atomic bomb was so devastating to Nagasaki, and his firsthand account of the people with their skin melting, dying out in desperation for water, water, miso, miso. Um, that is not the story that we're talking about here. I'm more interested in talking about the Japanese from the 1600s to the 1800s, uh, or really the 1500s to the 1800s, because that 300-year period is going to be instructive for perhaps what we're about to live through in the Western world. Okay, so the first story is about uh, Yukon Takamaya. Now, Takamaya, Takamaya was basically a feudal lord. Okay, they would call those uh, daimyos. So he's a feudal lord, which means he's essentially arist uh, arist uh, an aristocrat. Uh, he comes from the aristocracy. Um, he's somewhat of a noble. Uh, he's landed. He's wealthy. He has political influence with the shogun, who is the uh, ruling dictator of the time. Um, and so he becomes a radical convert conversion. He experiences radical conversion and becomes a Roman Catholic. You see, the Jesuits, when they arrived on the island, they were so fervent for the faith. And they were prepared to teach anybody and everybody, noblemen and commoner alike. And they converted and baptized thousands of people, thousands of people. One of the things that the Jesuits did in Japan that is a little bit unique relative to their behavior just a hundred years before in the New World is they didn't bring Portuguese culture with them or Italian culture or Spanish culture. They came and they brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. They brought the Catholic faith and they had a deep respect for the culture that was already there. So they didn't go and try to wipe out the Japanese language. They didn't try to appropriate European culture and, and emplace it there because what they found in Japan was a graceful, orderly people, precisely what I found when I lived in Japan. So they said, there's no reason to wipe any of this out. There's nothing inherently evil about a high tea ceremony. In fact, the tea ceremony in Japan is reflective of high tea in Britain. 
So uh, the Jesuits actually had an order that each of the Jesuit houses in Japan would have a separate room just for the tea ceremony. That's how respectful they were of the Japanese people and their culture. So this is this is a little asterisk you can place next to uh, Jesuitical activity in the 15th, 16th, and century, 17th century uh, because in the 15th century, when they came to the New World, of course, they brought Spanish and Portuguese and, and Italian culture with them because what they encountered in the New World were absolutely barbarian savages who were cutting each other's hearts out. That's not what they found in Japan, and they really wanted to preserve all of the natural virtue that they found there. Okay, notwithstanding all of that, we're back to Takamaya, or Takayama. So Takayama, he's one of these barons, and he exercises incredible authority, uh, and he's pretty much like the St. Thomas More of his time, very well respected, an intellectual. Um, I think it says that uh, that he, he was a master of calligraphy, which was a big deal on the island back then. And uh, so Takayama becomes this radical convert to the Catholic faith, and the, uh, the reigning emperor, uh, Hideyoshi, and you'll hear Hideyoshi's name here on, on, on the next story I'm going to tell you too, he sort of courts him and wants to bring him back to his side, exactly the way Henry VIII tried to court St. Thomas More uh, back to his side. So he, he first wanted to bestow more honors and titles upon him and gave him more land and, and try to convince him that, you know, that, that the Japanese way of life is, is, is good enough and this foreign religion is really destabilizing to, the, to a well-ordered society. Um, and, the, and he used every trick in the book. He used all the arguments that he could. In the end, uh, the Shogun was un, unimpressive and unsuccessful, and Takayama remained a Christian. He was stripped of everything, just like St. Thomas More. He lost his titles, he lost his land, he lost his family, he lost his freedom, he was jailed, he was tortured. Um, unlike St. Thomas More, he was not martyred, they didn't chop off his head. They just, uh, they, he was socially martyred, he was exiled from Japan. The only home he ever knew, the place in which he grew up, and he was sent away, I think, to China. Um, so that is their version of St. Thomas More. It's funny how history repeats itself. Um, okay, second story. That's just that's just to that's just to whet the appetite here. This story is going to make you weep. I might even open the book to read passages because there were some there were there were just some things that I'm not going to be able to relay to you the same way that a professional author with an expansive vocabulary could relay. But this same man, uh, Hideyoshi, who had just recently consolidated power, crowned himself as, as Shogun, using the ancient title of Shogun, um, which is sort of a slap in the face to the emperor, but it was also kind of a throwback to the samurai culture of Japan. And he ruled with an iron fist, and he he viewed the Christians with absolute skepticism. Now, at first, he was totally fine with them. They were building roads and schools and brought medicine and making people happy, and this was all well and good until so many people became Catholic. And when the Jesuits experienced an immeasurable success in bringing souls to the one true faith, well, he got a little jealous couldn't take it, and he decided that he was going to make a scene, a spectacle. He wanted to have a, a, a level of carnage that would scare the people out of being Christian. He wanted to scare Christ out of people's hearts, and that's what he attempted to do. So the story of the 26 martyrs of Nagasaki, uh, what he does is he rounds up 26 well-known Christians from a distant village, from uh, from from his capital city in Kyoto, and he he force marches them in the dead of winter from Kyoto to Nagasaki. He wants them to arrive in Nagasaki because the the sea is there. The principal mass of Catholics is in Nagasaki. Nagasaki is fundamentally a Catholic city. They have built churches. They have built schools. They have the they they are singing the Sanctus. Uh, just in their in their family life, as they're preparing f for meal time. I mean, this was a very common thing back then, the sanctus. Um, and so, 
he says, I have to strike Nagasaki. I have to strike in the heart of what is essentially Japanese Christendom, which is the city of Nagasaki. So it's a 30-day forced march in the dead of winter, barefoot. 26 brave men and women are marched from Kyoto to Nagasaki. And when they arrive there, and first of all, the, the shogun's messengers already go to Nagasaki to let them know that the condemned are on their way. When they arrive, there's a prominent hill that overlooks the city, not far from where the train station is now in Nagasaki. And he uh, already has fresh cut 26 crosses lined up from the base of the hill, spanning all the way to the, to the height of the hill to the other side. So you can see from, from basically anywhere in the city, you can see 26 crosses lined up across the hill from top to bottom, from side to side. He has two guards per cross. So he's got 26 prisoners. He has 52 guards. Each is armed with a, uh, a bamboo, a long bamboo with a steel tip on it, okay, like a shear, like a spear, a, a steel tip spear. And so... Each of the 26 are hung on the crosses, not with nails like our Lord was hung. They are wrapped using rope and straw, and, uh, and, and, uh, and they are wrapped around their neck, and they are hanging there. And this, this shogun, Hideyoshi, wants to make this scene so grotesque, so memorable, so awful, such a spectacle such a scandal that it would scare people out of the church. And so that's what he attempts to do. They, they don't immediately, so when you're hanging from the cross and when you're lean from 30 days of near starvation, forced marching in the, in the wintertime, you know, barely clothed, you can clearly see the rib cage. And so if you're standing below the cross uh, with your spear, you can see exactly how you would enter the, the human body, the cavity, the body cavity underneath the rib cage. It's, it's a very clear target. And so each of the two guards stands ready, ready to pierce their victims. More than 4,000 Christians are there to witness this spectacle. And these are people who are already Christians. They're already attending Mass. They're already having, experiencing the sacraments, the grace of God in their lives. They're spreading the faith. They're all converts. And they witness that there are 26 men and women on the cross who are defiant, who are joyful. The 26 martyrs in Nagasaki go to their death with a smile on their face. In unison, they begin singing hymns. And the man who's, who's there to carry out this torture, he was given explicit instructions by Hideyoshi to make it as grotesque and memorable as possible. So that's why he's drawing it out. He's got the 26 hanging on the cross. He has his men there in place, and he's taking a beat. He wants it to be grotesque. He's letting the, he's letting the scene play out. And as the scene unfolds, the 4,000 witnesses are sung to. They hear the Psalms. They hear the Sanctus. They hear Psalm 31, Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit, exactly what our Lord said on the cross at the crucifixion. And then finally they hear one of the 26, who is a Jesuit, give a, a stirring speech. He mustered the courage, the strength for his voice to be heard by all. And he said, I die even though I've committed no sin. I die for the love of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I die for the Catholic Church and I go happily to my grave. I forgive Hideyoshi and all who are committing this injustice against me and my countrymen here. 
that's what they hear. Then the spears enter the body cavities and all 26 are martyred. At that point, the 4,000 who had been cheering on their brothers in the faith, their sisters in the faith, the 26 who are crucified in Nagasaki, the 4,000 turn from cheers to rage, and Hideyoshi's henchmen have to run for their lives and hide. What he hoped to accomplish, the extinguishment of Christianity in Nagasaki, he didn't. And isn't that what always happens? Isn't that what we always see? Isn't that what happened in ancient Rome under the likes of Diocletian and Nero? Isn't that what happens every time the church is persecuted? That the blood of the martyrs creates more conversions. Well, that's what happened in Nagasaki. So they had a real problem on their hands. They had a real problem after the 26 martyrs. The growth, the explosive growth of Christianity continued throughout all of Japan. And uh, what made this, what made the spread even more um, perfect, I guess, that what, what made the environment in Japan so susceptible to the spread of of the legend of the 26 in Nagasaki is already in the natural virtue of the people who were heavily influenced by the samurai code. Because to a samurai, going to your death joyfully and hoping for your eternal reward and dying in battle for your lord, little L, lord, was the height of your life. It was the height of your life. So when these samurai-ruled, samurai-trained Japanese pagans heard about this legend of 26 brave Christians who sang hymns to their lord, Big L, Big L, um, and died with smiles on their face to the cheers of 4,000, That's pretty compelling. That was pretty compelling for them, and the baptisms were overwhelming. The baptisms were overwhelming. Okay, third story. Third story to to paint the picture of the Japanese Christian church from the 1500s to the 1800s. In 1614, the shogun really consolidated their power. Uh, because there, you know, there's this, there's this constant feudal tribal power struggle. No one really rules all of Japan at one time, uh, in the absence of the emperor, because, you know, when you overthrow your, uh, rightful heir, you know, when, uh, out of disorder, uh, out of chaos, it's hard to recreate order, um, And so there was always, there were always number twos and number threes and number fours vying for power. But in 1614, the Shogun really did consolidate power. And he, um, he made it his personal mission to eradicate Christianity in, um, in Japan. He viewed Christianity as a subversive foreign religion, philosophy, and a threat to the unity of the Japanese people, whom he had just spilled so much blood, uniting and under his under his control. So in 1614, the foreigners are uh, unceremoniously expelled from Japan. All the European-blooded uh, men are kicked off of the island, and Christianity is henceforth banned and outlawed. 1614 is a pivotal year because... This is the year where the regime, which was more or less in some periods tolerant, we would say, tolerant of the Christian faith, um, now turns its teeth against them. It now shows its their true form. And they say, no more, no Christians, and if I catch you worshiping, um, you're dead. So the churches are closed, the priests are sent back to Europe, uh, the Japanese priests, if they're found offering mass, are, are, are tortured and killed. And the church has to go underground. This situation persists, ladies and gentlemen, for 250 years. 
for 250 years, there were no priests. For 250 years, there were no sacraments. There was no catechism. There were no books. There was no liturgy. There were no hymns. There was no public prayer. It was illegal. Christians would be bound by the secret police who would be spying on the people, floating amongst them. They would be found. They would be tried. They would be tortured. If they gave up names, those names would be found, tried, and tortured. For 250 years, there was no bishop. There was no visible church for the Japanese people. How did they cope with this? How did they transmit the faith? Did they transmit the faith? Well, here's what's remarkable. For 250 years, for something like nine generations, the faith was transmitted. There was a faith. There was a church. There were baptisms. They were all conducted by parents because it was an emergency. There were no priests. There was catechism because it was handed on verbally oral tradition. There was singing and hymns because it was done in the dark of night. It was done in a stable outside of Nagasaki, four miles north. For 250 years, there were three men who carried on the tradition for all the Christian people in in Nagasaki. There was the water man, and he was appointed to carry out all the baptisms. And when he died, his oldest son would take up his work, and he would be the new water man. So there was one family who was in charge of baptizing all the Christians in Nagasaki. There was a second man who was dubbed the calendar man. The calendar man made sure to keep track of the high feasts, Easter, Christmas, Corpus Christi. He knew where they were in the liturgical year. He informed everyone what was happening in the, in the church that was to them invisible at the time. But they kept the time. They kept the calendar. They kept the feasts. They kept all the traditions. They fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays and Saturdays. They abstained from meat and made sacrifices on Fridays. They observed rogation days, ember days, Lent, Advent. And then there was the all-important Chokata. And the Chokata was the man who was appointed to be the leader, the lay leader in the absence of the church. He made the calls. He made the decisions. He was the protector. He was entrusted with passing on the faith from generation to generation. And this was passed on from father to oldest son faithfully for 250 years, for nine generations. When a French priest was welcomed back into Japan, just a year or two after Commodore Perry reopened Japan to the West, and Japan signed a trade agreement with the United States, and therefore opened up uh, all, all the Europeans to going to Japan. In 1864, Father, uh, his name is Petitjean, Father Petitjean from France, He arrives back to Nagasaki after having been reading for six years in the seminary about the Japanese Catholics, the glorious 60 years of baptisms and spread of the faith from St. Francis Xavier, his spiritual grandfather. So father gets to Nagasaki and he builds a church, a brand new church. 
And it's for the Europeans. At this point, Europeans are now moving to Yokohama, to Nagasaki, to Kyoto. And they're taking up residence there because this is part of a huge brand new trade market that is happening. And they're facilitating trade between Japan and China, between Japan and Europe, between Japan and the United States. So an influx of Europeans comes to the island. And the skeptical shogun who are still in power say to themselves, okay, look, the Catholic faith is fine for the Europeans, but it is absolutely forbidden to the locals. So if you have round eyes, if you're European, you can go in and out of the church and nobody's going to bother you. But if you are Japanese, if you are a local, if you are found even on the stone steps of the church in Nagasaki, you will be prosecuted under the full force of the law, and you could be tortured and killed. Okay, so father arrives, 1864. Now, just eight years before his arrival, okay, eight years before his arrival, the Chokata, the head lay leader of the Christians in Nagasaki, was captured brutally brutally tortured and killed. He's probably a saint in heaven. He's a martyr. He died for the saint, for the, for the faith. And he didn't give up any names. He gave them nothing. He gave them nothing. He went faithfully to his brutal death by himself, leaving behind his firstborn son, who at that time was an infant, Okay, so father arrives eight years later. Now you've got the Chokata is an eight-year-old boy. So it makes, a, it makes a lot of news that there's a French priest in town. And all the elders are debating. And they finally conclude that, you know what, the Chokata is not old enough to decide. So maybe we should just wait until he's 10 or 12 and then he can decide. This is the reverence that these people have for order, for nobility, for primogenitor, firstborn son. And so because the Chokata was only six, seven, eight, nine years old and he wasn't capable of making the decision himself, um, they didn't, I don't, I don't think they invented what they had in Europe at the time during, you know, during the European monarch, monarchies where if you had a very young monarch, then you would have like a regent who's your, your mother or your grand or, or an aunt or uncle or somebody who's can help you make the decisions, but you know, without, without ever uh, having a, um, a case for usurping your authority or, or, uh, stepping on your toes and stealing the crown. So the Chocata is eight years old, um, all the elders, the men, are just debating. They're just, they're just locked in heated debate about what they should do. Because if they, if they show up to this church and the secret police are there, the shogun's police are there, that's it. They're dead. And very likely they're going to be tortured. Probably they're going to find out about the other underground Christians. And this is going to be bad news. So, you know, a lot of them are making the prudential decision in their minds to say, look, I am a hu I'm a fallen human person. I might sit here and tell you in the camera that I would happily go to my grave for our Lord, for the faith, for the church, that I would wear my, my martyr's crown with a smile on my face. But talk is cheap, ladies and gentlemen, and it's easy for me to sit here in the camera and tell you that I would do that. It's only when the chips are down when the steel-tipped lance is piercing my bod body cavity, that's when you'll know. That's when I'll know. That's when we'll all know what we're really made of. Um, and so a lot of these guys are saying, look, I'm not going to go and risk getting captured, getting tortured, probably getting found out. Other people will get captured because of me. And they're locked in this debate and they can't make a decision. In a break with tradition, with Japanese tradition, the women... The women, they all decide these guys, these old guys are, they just don't get it. They could sit here and debate this for hours. And listen, I know plenty of people who could sit in a basement and debate something for hours and do nothing about it in the end. You know those people too. So the women say, you know what? We're not going to put up with that. We're just going to do 
we're just going to do a bias for action. So the very next day, a couple dozen of them dress themselves up like poor fishermen, fisherwomen, uh, take a boat up the river into just outside of Nagasaki. They get off the boat. They walk a mile. Uh, it is presumed that they are just, you know, poor fisher people. They're looking for provisions for their, you know, country bumpkin life because these people lived, you know, in the countryside so that they could practice the faith in a barn. And, um, and they reach the church that father had just built and they look around, no sign of the Shogun's police, no sign of the secret police, no sign of any spies. All right, ladies, let's just make a break for it. And they go up the stone stairs and they open the doors and they find Father Petitjean there kneeling and praying the office. Now, it is. it actually says in one of the books that Father was it was a it was a rainy day it was gloomy it was it was uh gray and he after all this excitement and anticipation of wanting to go to Japan of wanting to rekindle and locate the Nagasaki Catholic community he hasn't found a single one where are they i guess they're gone i guess they were all killed i guess the shogun and the samurai succeeded in suppressing the catholic church and extinguishing it there's no there's not even an ash, a smoldering ash of tradition. So he's there on this gloomy day, just in um, in a bad state of mind. He's depressed. And these women walk in to the church. And they find him there. And they immediately start accosting him. They say, where is Mother Mary? And he looks at her and he looks at them startled. He's praying, his, he's praying the office. He says, and, 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 you know, he, Japanese is not his native language, so he has to translate in his mind, and he's, thinking, he's thrown off his course. Where is Mother Mary? Where is she? Where's Mother Mary? And then he realizes, these women, they're asking me, what, well, uh, and one of the women says, do not be afraid, Father, we are of the same heart. Where is Mother Mary? Now, why are they asking this question, ladies and gentlemen? Why are they asking this? This is the most beautiful. I'm getting goosebumps right now telling you this story. Because when the Jesuits were kicked off the island 250 years prior, when they looked their Japanese Catholics in the eyes for the last time, they made a solemn promise to them. They said, we will be back. The church will be back to Japan. And you need to look for the church, for the true church. So there are three things that you will look for to know that it is we who have returned to you. Because, of course, by this point, the false church, the heretical church of uh, Protestantism had been invented. So the Jesuits who were famous for fighting the Protestants all over the world... They were worried that if they got kicked out of Japan, that the you know the Calvinists would would then show up later and undo all of their work and drag all the souls to hell. So they said, first of all, you will know that it is we because the priests will be celibate. Second of all, you will know that it is we because we will speak of the Papa in Rome. And finally, you will know that it is we who have returned to you because we will bring you Our Lady. She will be with us. And if you do not see Our Lady, then it is not the true church. Where there is no lady, there is no church. That, what was, that is what was passed down for nine generations in hiding in secret amongst cow manure in a barn. The women had already confirmed that father was celibate. They had asked around in the little village outside of Nagasaki 
about the tall Frenchman. And everyone said, no, he, he took no wife. So when they walked into the church, they demanded to know, where is Our Lady? And when Father brought them to the eastern side of the church, the alcove, and showed them the statue of Our Lady holding the infant king. These holy and pious women dropped to their knees and with an explanation, with a cry of joy that echoed 250 years of waiting, they let out a gasp, a sigh of relief. The church has come back. Arrangements were then made and introductions made and uh, Father was introduced to the water man, the Baptist, the calendar man, the liturgist, and to the chocata. And eventually he made his way out and for the first time in nine generations, Mass was offered in a stable at midnight in the freezing cold. This similarity to the Christmas story was not lost on the Japanese people who are attuned to symbolism. They are attuned to finding meaning in these sorts of things. In fact, on December 26th, each year for 250 years, they had a tradition in which they would add extra hay to the cows in the stable in honor of the Holy Family in their lonely sojourn. That is the most beautiful story that I will tell you probably for the next several podcasts. That is the story of our faith. That is the story of the Japanese Catholics. It is a remarkable story. So what? What do we do with this information? What do we do with this beautiful, stunning, tear-jerking story? I'm getting emotional just thinking about this. These people waiting for the church, the church that had abandoned them. Well, let's fast forward now, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look at 2020. Let's look at the similarities. First of all, how many of us have felt abandoned by the church in 2020? How many of us, because of this so-called pandemic, every single bishop walked away from us? Every single bishop told his priests to abandon us. Every single bishop informed us that he is more concerned about our body than our souls. That's what happened in 2020. And it is a feeling of abandonment. And how many people went 16 weeks, 18 weeks with no sacraments? How many even now, as I'm recording this, approaching the Feast of the Assumption have been without sacraments since March? How many souls in these United States will go the entire year without sacraments? I feel bad if you're in Los Angeles, the head of the USCCB there, an absolute coward, clown, tyrant. Spineless, faithless. I have no problem leveling these accusations because his actions speak for himself. Archbishop Gomez does not believe that the sacraments can convey grace to your soul because he has deprived you of your sacraments. If you were waiting to be baptized and confirmed into the faith, you will still wait. If you've been planning your wedding, You can live in sin. If you're on your deathbed and you need viaticum, 
you can die. That's not how a bishop acts. So, in some ways, we share with our Japanese counterparts in their 250 years without the sacraments, without any signs of the visible church on earth, totally abandoned. In other ways, though, we're much better off, clearly. We can communicate with each other. We can console each other. We can still read our catechisms. We can still transmit the faith. Even in the height of the lockdown, when all the dioceses were shut down, there were underground masses. I was able to attend several. I'm sure many of you were able to attend several. I'm sure some of us found ourselves in barns, just like our Japanese counterparts, just like Our Lady and St. Joseph and Our Lord. Um, the real oppression against the church, the real passion of the church, the state turning its teeth, turning its sights on the church, hasn't really happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. I did report over the weekend that the Supreme Court has made it possible. They've cleared the path. They have ruled in a 5-4 to stunning decision in which John Roberts voted with the majority, with the liberals. John Roberts, ostensibly a Catholic. They voted to allow any state, any municipality, to govern the total number of Catholics that are allowed to worship at any one time. For the good of the public. So uh, it is now permissible for your state or local county level bureaucrat to tell your church that, oh, well, mass can only happen with five people in it. And if they can tell you how many people can be there, they can tell you what you can and can't do there, just like they're doing in Toronto where they say no communion because that might transmit the virus. Just like they're doing in California where they say no music that could transmit the virus. Just like they were attempting to do in St. Paul, Minneapolis, where they just placed our Lord in an envelope and said, you can take your envelope out to your car because communion might spread the virus. They could say no more than five at a mass because that could spread the virus. They could say no altar boys because a priest could infect servers. They could say no chant. They could say no incense because the incense might pick up a spitlet dropule and the smoke will float out and you could get the virus. So you see, the state has every tool of oppression, of tyranny that it needs. The only question is, when will they begin to yield, wield wield those tools against us, um, it's only a matter of time. And as I told you over the weekend, it doesn't matter if Trump wins or loses it. It is inevitable that we will share the fate of our Japanese counterparts. If Trump loses, it'll happen sooner than later, but all he is is a four-year Band-Aid. So it doesn't matter if it's four months or four years and four months. It will come to us. It is happening. The public opinion is shifting radically against Roman Catholicism, especially against conservative, orthodox, and traditionalist Roman Catholicism, which constitutes you, the people who are watching and listening to this channel. So what do we have in common with the Japanese? Well, at least we don't share their level of oppression yet. But it is worth looking at how they survived. Because you can never eradicate the faith. It cannot be stomped out. It cannot be extinguished. It might go into hiding. It might be a remnant. It might be regularly bludgeoned and martyred. But it will never go away. And it won't go away because we will pass it on no matter what. The Japanese passed it on from generation to generation in a deliberate underground fashion. And they didn't do it perfectly. 
When that French priest arrived in Nagasaki, he found that some of their pronunciations were wrong. In 250 years, they pronounced our Lord's name a little bit differently. In 250 years, they pronounced Our Lady's name just a little bit differently. But the bones were right. They knew what they were looking for. They knew that no Mary, no church. No celibacy, no church. We will pass it on as well. We will transmit the faith from generation to generation as well. But my exhortation to you, my exhortation to myself, is that we cannot transmit that which we do not know. We can't pass on that which we do not have. We cannot share that which we do not possess. It is therefore incumbent upon all of us to go as deep into our faith as possible, as quickly as possible, and make all of the practical preparations that you can. I know that this can sound conspiratorial and hyperbolic, but for anyone that's lived halfway through 2020, what doesn't sound impossible? What doesn't sound hyperbolic at this point? We've been through the ringer. We've been through quite a journey together. Get physical books. Don't rely on digital technology. Don't rely on the fact that you might have the internet, your phones, some hard drive full of books. Get the real books. Get the liturgical year. Get the Catechism of Trent. Get the Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Ludwig Ott. Get Denzinger. Get the Golden Legend. We have 20 centuries of information that we need to consume and pass on. Get multiple copies. Store multiple copies in different places. Does that sound crazy? I don't think it sounds crazy. At a minimum, they make really wonderful wedding gifts to your children someday. I have several copies of the liturgical year bound, hard cover. Not a cheap thing. It's a pretty large investment. But, you know, if the chastisement doesn't come in my lifetime, here you go, David. Here you go, Thomas. You take this set. This is your wedding gift. So get books and read them. Get off of Netflix. Get off of YouTube. Even if you have to get off of this channel, if you if you just cut the cord and get off of YouTube whatsoever, I will be so happy for you. I will be so happy. Besides, you can still find me on Facebook. But my exhortation to you is that hard times seem like they're coming. We have the benefit of foresight. We can see it coming. We can see our society coming unfrayed. We can see the Black Lives Matter communists toppling our statues, attempting to destroy our patrimony, what limited Catholic patrimony we have in America as it stands severing our roots. If they can sever our roots, if they can convey a sense of class hatred, and if they can strike during an economic calamity, which we are in, then they can implement communism. That's what it takes. That's all it takes. You have to sever a people's roots and make them ashamed of their of themselves. You have to incite shame. You have to incite instability. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. So whether or not Trump wins or loses, it doesn't matter. The process is underway and the process cannot be reversed. That's not to sound defeatist. That's not to to sound sad or upset. That's just to sound realistic. 
your churchmen, your clergy, your priests, and your bishops will not fight it. They will not oppose it. They will stand by like wimps, like bystanders, like cowards. Not a single state governor told them to shut their churches down. The president didn't tell them to shut their churches down. The Congress, the Supreme Court. The U.S. Marshals, the United States Army, the National Guard, nobody told them to shut their churches down, and yet they folded like a house of cards. When times get really rough, do you think that they're going to discover that they have spines? No. They've shown us who they are, and that is, I think, the biggest silver lining in this whole 2020 fiasco. We know who stands where. We know for a fact what Joseph and I have been saying on this channel now for 15 months. That if you are a husband, father, if you are a wife, mother, you are alone. Your burden is heavy. You have to carry your burden alone. You cannot count on anyone around you. If you want to transmit the faith and stay in the state of grace and remain a friend of God, you are alone. It is a lonely journey. Your priest might not be there for you. Your bishop might not be there for you. Your cousins and your sisters and your, and your, they might not be there for you. Half of them are afraid of a fake virus. Okay, it's a real virus. It just doesn't kill most people. It's like the flu. So when the going is going to get tough, it's going to get tough. Think to the Japanese story they survived for 250 years. They survived. They kept the faith, and many of those Japanese Catholics are in heaven. Pray to the 26 martyrs, the holy martyrs of Nagasaki. You ever wonder why they nuked Nagasaki? I'm not going to go into that, but it was not a military or strategic target. Think about that. Think about that. You want to wipe out this pesky Catholic church and you're a Freemason and you happen to be president? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nuke Nagasaki. No military advantage to doing that whatsoever. Many aspects of the Nagasaki Cathedral. Now I'm getting into this book. I told you I wasn't going to get into this book, all right? But you're, if you're still listening right now, you're interested, right? Am I right? Okay, because most of you will have listened to like 9 to 21 minutes of this thing, and you would have moved on with your days. But if you're still watching right now, you want to hear this? So uh, many beautiful things. In fact, like one of the large facades of the cathedral in Nagasaki the only structure standing after the nuke. Yeah. That's a sign. You got to get this book. Definitely get this book. Um, you know the reason why I bought it? Since we're, since we're just in overtime now and uh, we're off script and I'm just telling you what I really think about things. This is like a bonus segment. This is like the bloopers reel, except I'm not, this is not a blooper. This is like legit, like uh, mic unplugged. Mic on the mic. I bought this book because I went to a, an Ignatian retreat, uh, a, a six-day silent Ignatian retreat. And that was the first time I ever learned any of this, the Ignatian spiritual exercises, which are so incredible, so powerful. Maybe I should do a whole show about that. You guys should like definitely look into that. There are retreat centers all around the country run by incredibly wonderful priests who all wear cassocks, incidentally, and offer the Mass uh, in a way that our Japanese forefathers would recognize. I'll just leave it at that. But um, I bought the book because the retreat master was making an allusion to the torments of hell. 
and he was he he made this he used a lot of military imagery he was an air force guy which is you know like pretty close to being military and um so he was he was making these incredible comparisons and the image of hell to me was just so so memorable because of what he was describing in this book that the people who had experienced the nuclear bomb who were within the blast radius who they weren't just you know eradicated and into and and you know particleized atomized okay but the people on the outskirts who were burned by the radiation they they lived for minutes and they i mean they they their their bodies were burned changed scarred uh almost like you might burn fat okay on a skillet i mean and their skin was melting off of their bodies and their bones were showing through. I sorry, this is not for children. And some of them could walk for a few minutes and then they were crawling and as they were crawling they were leaving like, you know, their elbow skin behind them. And every single one of them that this eyewitness, okay? This this man, this eyewitness was there. Uh, he happened to be in his radiology lab, which is why he didn't get burned in the first wave of the bomb. But um, Dr. Nagai witnessed that every single person was calling out, desperately parched, begging for a drop of water. 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 Their voices were changed, desperate, sad. If they could just get one drop of water, a thirst that they had never experienced in their life, their whole body had just been burnt. They were melting. People, moments from death, water. And that the fires of hell, as the retreat master was telling us, would be far, far, far worse than that. And it wouldn't just last a few fleeting moments. It would last forever. No end. No end. When you compare the torments of hell and the awfulness of it, and you weigh that against what the apostate bishop Robert Barron teaches, that hell might be temporary. We might empty it out in the end. Maybe there's nobody there. Dare we hope that it's all just going to be fine. Do you see how insidious, how wicked, how cruel, how evil, how uncharitable, how diabolical it is that he can say that. We know that there is a hell. We know that people go there. The saints and mystics have shown us hell. And we know that it is eternal. We know these things. Our faith teaches us these things. The saints, mystics, and doctors of the church have taught us these things. Our Lord taught us these things. And a so-called prince of the church has the audacity to unteach them? Do you see why I just can't let it go? I can't let it go because if one person watching this video or this channel, if one person avoids hell, then... What else is there? What else is there? Okay, one final quote, like guys, ladies and gentlemen. Our incredible, 
incredible priest. I'm very lucky here in the heart of America. It's specifically why I live here because I have so many great priests here. But our incredible priest this Sunday reminded us of something that St. Thomas said. St. Thomas Aquinas. He said that the grace of God in a human soul, in one single human soul, is worth more than the natural goodness of all of creation. The grace of God in a human soul is worth more than the oceans, than the mountains, than the world, than the whales, than the trees. It's worth more than the endangered turtles. The grace in one human soul. What is grace again? Do we know our definitions? Partaking in the divine life of God, sharing in the divine life. The ability of one immortal human soul to share eternally in the divine life of God is worth more than physical reality. Why do I hammer our bishops so much? Why do I point out that they are naturalists? They've lost the faith. They care more about your body than your soul. Because they have forgotten their Aquinas. They have forgotten that the grace in your soul is worth more than your body. Than all bodies than all physical reality. That is why RTF exists. That is why the Catholic Church exists or ought to exist. And to the extent that these so-called princes of the church apostolically succeeded from the apostles themselves, to the extent that they forget to teach you that, decline to teach you that, or in Barron's case, teach you the opposite of the truth, heresy, he's an apostate, I I won't be able to let it go. I'm sorry. I won't be able to let it go, and hopefully now you understand why. Just in the example of Nagasaki. God bless you. Thank you for watching this. I'm sorry I went long. I didn't plan to go long. I just really, I got I got talking. I got excited. You know I was stationed in Okinawa. I loved it there. I have an admiration for the Japanese people. They're incredible people. I wish that we could convert them. You know, only less than 1% of them are Catholic. Even today, we can go there. They're not going to kick us off. There are no shoguns. There are no samurais. We're not going to get, you know, chopped in half with their swords. Uh, I wish we could convert the Japanese people, but maybe I, you know what, more importantly than that for me anyway, I wish we could convert America. I wish we could convert our own people. So let's reconvert our own people. Let's convert our neighbors. And then maybe God willing, someday the United States will be a great missionary base from which we can launch missionaries into the world and convert the whole world for the church. Our lady queen of heaven, pray for us. No Mary, no church. Thank you so much. Subscribe. If you're watching this video, you didn't subscribe. You're wrong. I know the analytics tell me three out of four of you who watch the video are not subscribed. Why wouldn't you subscribe? I need to have subscribers. The more subscribers we get, the more I can do this for you. Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You can find us, Restoring the Faith Media, on Patreon. It is only because of the patrons and their generosity that I'm able to keep this up. God bless you. The words of Mike have ended. No Mary, no church. Living the Faith Podcast. Brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. Restoringthefaith.com